Thank you very much, Neil. Now, the information that I'm going to disseminate tonight will likely pertain to at least one out of three people sitting in these pews tonight. One way or another, what I'm going to disclose will help you prevent a stroke. I think we're going to hook me up on a mic right now. Uh, it's going to help you prevent a stroke. And in, in the event that there is uh, symptoms uh, developing in your body uh, of a, uh, an acute stroke, you're going to know what to demand from your, uh, your health provider, your emergency room physician, because it isn't always obvious. It isn't always obvious to the doctor, and doctors don't always make the best attempt to reverse what can be a crippling stroke, where you remain in a nursing home for a decade or longer with half of your body paralyzed when effective interventions could have been implemented. And I want to say three years ago, almost three years ago to this day, my aunt suffered an ischemic stroke. It was reversible had the information I'm going to disseminate tonight been used, but she didn't go to the right hospital. They didn't have the technology, and as a result, half of her body has been paralyzed. She's been in a nursing home for the past three years. All of that was unnecessary, and it's because of her stroke that motivated me to look into why couldn't they remove that blood clot that was occluding flow to a portion of her brain. And it turned out there was a way. She just unfortunately was unable to get to the proper medical facility. Now, there are about 2,000 acute strokes every single day in this country. If you add that up, it's over 700,000 a year. So this is not an insignificant problem. It's a major health issue. It's often listed as the third leading cause of death and the number one cause of disability. And these disabilities are horrific. Paralysis, which includes losing hearing, losing your vision on one side of your body. It's a horrific procedure. And you're in a place where you don't want to be. You're around a bunch of other people who are suffering from Alzheimer's and other fatal conditions that take a long time before the lethality manifests. So this is not an, ins an in insignificant issue we're talking about. And as it relates to what are the outcomes? Well, if you go to the right medical center and they implement the right procedure, you may be out in a few days. Even if it was a major stroke, they now have technology to reverse that acute ischemic event. Ischemia refers to loss of blood flow. And as it relates to ischemic stroke, that's loss of blood flow to a portion of the brain. If there's enough loss of blood flow, by the way, the stroke can acutely kill. But in many cases, it leaves the victim paralyzed. In some cases, there's a recovery. In many cases, it's permanent paralysis. The patient never leaves the nursing home confinement. Now, what we want to talk about first is what's the best way to prevent the occurrence of a stroke in your body? And it is keeping your blood pressure at the low end of the normal range. Don't think about normal from the standpoint of the way the American Heart Association defines it. You want to be in the optimal range of blood pressure, which the American Heart Association just two days ago made a major announcement that confirms what our organizations have been recommending now since the mid-1980s. The American Heart Association now says optimal systolic blood pressure readings are under 120 milligrams of mercury. That's millimeters per mercury. That is huge. That's a huge breakthrough from the standpoint of conventional medicine catching up on where optimal blood pressure should be. Now, so many people, when they're diagnosed with hypertension, they interestingly say, well, I've always had low blood pressure. This is what they'll say to their doctors and, and their friends. I've always had a low blood pressure, and here I've been diagnosed with hypertension. Well, the fact of the matter is, hypertension is a manifestation of normal aging. And as you can see from this chart, the vast majority of people who are over 65, over 75, the vast majority are hypertensive. And this is based on the guidelines before the American Heart Association made the announcement two days ago that optimal readings are under 140. This chart is based on readings that are over 139. 
In other words, they were looking at people's systolic pressure, and that's the most important one to realize, by the way, that upper number, the systolic number, because that reflects the pumping of the heart and the pressure against the arterial system with each heartbeat. And as you can see, lots and lots of people have hypertension. Reality is the vast majority of Americans over age 65 are now clinically hypertensive as it relates to the conventional guidelines. Now, we look at the diseases that are related to hypertension, and it goes way beyond stroke. People can have their kidneys shut down and be on dialysis. That's a thrice weekly procedure where you go in and they'll run your blood through a dialysis machine that only partially cleans it the way your healthy kidneys were, but it's an inconvenient thing to do, and it has its own side of side, side, set of side effects. And what that means is you can be undergoing dialysis, your homocysteine levels go through the roof, your C-reactive protein levels go through the roof, and you are at a significantly increased risk of cardiovascular disease by virtue of the dialysis procedure itself. But it's needed if your kidneys happen to shut down. But in, in response to hypertension, there's some mild cognitive impairment. Your coronary artery disease risk surges. You've got all kinds of risk factors that could all be prevented if you just kept your blood pressure into the optimal range, which is under 120 on the systolic number. You want that to be under 120. I try to keep mine under 115. People who practice calorie restriction, their systolic blood pressure is often in the 90s. It's very low, and they're very healthy. So it just gives you an indicator that normal blood pressure for an, uh, a typical person, it's going to be around 150 systolic. Well, they normally will then suffer heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure. They'll have all these other problems because they allowed what the conventional medicine said was normal to apply to them. We want to be abnormal. We don't want to be like everybody else who suffers all of these degenerative conditions of aging. And that's why we are fighting so hard against the establishments continuing not to recognize what optimal blood pressure should be for most of their patients. Now, there was a huge debate that's gone on for over 30 years as to what the definition of hypertension was. And they used that word abnormally high blood pressure. But in reality, uh, that's not really the case. Uh, medicine would define blood pressure as any level high enough that it may eventually cause a disease to manifest. And what we looked at, though, is the fact that, well, most people have higher than optimal blood pressure. Hypertension is not abnormal by any means. It's abnormal if you're 65 and older to have blood pressure at the low end. That's, uh, you can push it down, by the way, with lifestyle changes and medications, but if you're 65 and you don't have hypertension, you're abnormal. So you want to get yourself into a situation where you have optimal blood pressure readings. And all of this data, by the way, that I'm presenting tonight was before the American Heart Association made their announcement that they finally agreed with what the scientific literature consistently sh showed. And that is people with low blood pressure live longer, have fewer strokes, fewer heart attacks, fewer incidences of all the diseases related to hypertension. The doctors got it wrong for well over 30 years. They were allowing people to leave their office with a systolic reading of 140, 150, and the doctor said, yeah, this is normal. This is what we're used to seeing, so you're okay. But of course, these people were not okay. That had horrific consequences. So this was a debate. Conventional medicine for decades said 140 over 90 is when you begin considering treating high blood pressure. Founders of this church, we said, well, wait a minute. If you're 140 over 90, you're at a significantly increased risk of all of these diseases, and yet the doctors weren't treating it. So we said, keep it under 120 over 80. Um, our optimal reading that we've said for many, many decades is 115 over 75. That's a target to shoot for. Doesn't mean, by the way, you should do it all at once. Uh, older people, if they try to drop their blood pressure too fast, they can suffer some uh, issues related to hypoperfusion of their brain, which would cause them to have a fall. So if you do have high blood pressure and you realize you need to lower it, it has to be done over a multi-month period. It has to be done very slowly, and you want to take some blood tests to ensure that your kidneys are not being adversely impacted. And I say that 
from the context that when a person has, let's say, a, a systolic reading of 150 and they panic and they push it down to 115, the kidneys, well, they're used to having that strong flow of blood running through and they sometimes then fail to filter out the toxins from your blood. So if you are hypertensive and you're older, slowly reduce your blood pressure and make sure you have an at-home blood pressure monitor so you can see what results you're getting with changes in lifestyle and or medications to slowly get it from let's say 145, 150 to get it down below that 120 number as long as you don't have symptoms of fainting, symptoms of dizziness, symptoms in which uh, a blood test results in showing some, some kidney impairment. So if you look at the deadly in impact of systolic blood blood pressure in the readings in which conventional medicine used to accept a 71 percent increased risk of stroke if your blood pressure is between 120 and 139. I mean that's huge. 50 percent increased risk of coronary artery disease. These are huge increases over one risk factor. Just ri one risk factor results in these huge increases and Doctors up until a couple days ago said between 120 and 139, that's okay. And we said it wasn't, and we were right, and we've saved a lot of lives, but not nearly as many as we could have. So this was the debate. It went on and on. I used to go on TV shows, radio shows, and talk about this, and medical doctors would call me in and say, I don't treat my blood pressure patients until it reaches 160 because they're all hypertensive. And I couldn't disagree with them. They were all hypertensive, but you should have done something to lower it because the fact of the matter is the data revealed something else. And uh, these benefits were conferred in year 2015. And this is the study that the American Heart Association based their recommendation two days ago on lowering blood pressure below 120. Because as you can see, there's a significant reduction in heart attack risk and stroke and overall mortality. 27% lower risk of dying if you keep your blood pressure below 120 as opposed to targeting it below 140. These are data, of course, published in the most prestigious medical journals in the world. These are supposedly read by medical doctors, but if they do read it, they fail to incorporate it into their medical practice. This is a real unfortunate event. So according to the American Association, American Heart Association's new guidelines, new guidelines, November 13th, the term prehypertension no longer exists. They have abolished the use of the term prehypertension, which was previously used to define blood pressure between 120 and 139. And, and the reason they abolished that is that slide I showed you a couple uh, times ago. You can see that people who have blood pressure between 120 and 139, um, they're not in good, very good shape. But if they push it below 120, they get all of these benefits. These are significant benefits, and these are ones you got to remember. If you, if you sometimes lapse when it relates to blood pressure and you have an at-home device and you're seeing yourself consistently at 135, well, you're going to say, I need to do something about that because I want to reduce my risk of all these disorders simply by pushing it below 120. So we have that huge, huge amount of data that substantiates what we have been preaching at this church and at other uh, events for a very long period of time. We've been presenting this data in a way that I'd like to think people have paid attention to it, at least the people who I've been working with. As it relates to the other risk factors for stroke, because blood pressure probably is number one right now. That is the number one way you can reduce your risk of having an ischemic stroke and even a hemorrhagic stroke where a blood vessel in your brain will rupture and, and bleed. I mean, that's a terrible thing and that's even harder to treat. But nonetheless, these are the blood factors that are involved in ischemic stroke and coronary artery disease and renal impairment. A whole host of vascular related ailments relate to high levels of C-reactive protein, homocysteine, fibrinogen, LDL cholesterol, and of course glucose and insulin. If these levels in your blood are elevated, well, take some steps to lower them. By doing so, you lower your risk of a heart attack and a stroke and a host of other vascular-related situations. These 
uh, situations, by the way, in some cases are very easy to reduce, as is blood pressure. There's a, there's a medication that we've recommended for several years called Telmisartan. We think it's the best antihypertensive drug uh, available. And here it is, it's a generic, doesn't cost a lot of money, and people don't even ask their doctor for the best drug. Sometimes the doctor prescribes a less than optimal drug. What I'm going to talk about now is what to do if you have symptoms of an acute stroke. What do you do to remove the clot that's impeding blood flow through a critical artery in your brain? Very, very important. You need to do something about that blood clot. Well, um, unfortunately, uh, up until very recently, the doctors were given up too soon. Patients would come in with a blocked cerebral artery and they weren't aggressively treating it. They'd literally watch the patient slowly become paralyzed and give them a little bit of heparin maybe to keep it from getting worse, but they do nothing to dissolve the blood clot. And what caused, caught our attention was a study back in 2011, and it showed that there was an effective therapy that had been approved, by the way, in 1996 called tissue plasminogen activator. It's a drug that when administered systemically into a patient will dissolve many of the clots that are blocking a portion of blood flow to the brain. It's a clot dissolving drug. And yet all these years after it was approved by the FDA in 1996, only a small percentage of community hospitals were using this drug. And this is an indication where if you don't know to tell your ER doctor, use TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, on my mother or on my loved one, uh, whoever the person is that you're the patient advocate for, there's a strong chance that the doctor won't utilize the best therapy. For all kind of reasons, medical technology that's in the published literature does not translate into clinical practice as quickly as we'd like. And as a result, you've got millions of people needlessly suffering paralysis and death, needlessly suffering that. So again, the clot that blocks blood flow to the brain is what's the underlying factor that creates paralysis and death. You want to get rid of that clot. And the technology was developed around 2006 where they would thread a catheter into the cerebral artery and mechanically remove the clot that was occluding blood flow to that portion of the brain. This is called an endovascular thrombectomy. It's a good word to put in your iPhone or something because in the event you're in an ER room, the doctor may not recommend an endovascular thrombectomy, even though it may very well save your life. Uh, the good news is more and more hospitals are incorporating this, but when I start putting on these, first started putting on these presentations, there were very few. There were typically one hospital in any given area that had the ability to deliver this therapy. What they'll usually do, by the way, first is try to use the TPA clot dissolving drug. And if that doesn't work, they'll go in there with a thrombectomy and attempt to remove the entire clot or do a combination of both. Maybe the TPA will be put right under the clot and then if it's not dissolved mechanically remove it. So an important word, endovascular thrombectomy. Thrombo stands for thrombus, blood clot, and this is the removal of a blood clot in the vascular system. Now this is a picture of my father-in-law uh, holding his six-month-old grandson. He was otherwise a healthy 80-year-old individual, but he had very incompetent medical care. He was undertreated for hypertension. He was given old line medications that were not controlling his blood pressure very well. And just a few months after this picture was taken, he suffered an ischemic stroke and he remained paralyzed for a number of years. And here he is in a nursing home bed. That little kid he was holding is now about three years old. He had a second grandson, but he didn't get quite able to enjoy that grandfather experience laying there in his own waist, unfortunately not able to get out of that bed. Half his body was paralyzed. He suffered a miserable three to four years before he died. Had he been given proper treatment for hypertension, he never would have had the stroke. Uh, or if he had been given proper treatment for whatever blood factors may have been underlying it, he wouldn't have had that stroke. So he is a victim, as is my aunt, as are many people you know. 
Many people you've known have suffered strokes, and up until the last couple decades, there wasn't a whole lot that could be done about it. And yet the scientific literature indicated that people who kept their blood pressure low, kept their LDL levels and glucose levels at the lower end of the normal range, well, they weren't suffering these horrific consequences. And that's really unfortunate that something's published in a medical journal, and it can take many decades before the public takes advantage of it. This is an article that I wrote in 2015. I sent it a, a draft of it around in 2014 to let people know about the endovascular thrombectomies. Here it was a technology that was available but it was being underutilized and people were being paralyzed from stroke that could be reversed on an acute basis. And that's one of the titles of this talk is reversing acute ischemic stroke. Once the brain damage has occurred, well then we're going to have to utilize some of our age reversal technologies to try to restore neuronal function. Because once those neurons have died, uh, there still are ones that are injured that we might be able to rescue. But it's, it's too late. This is an incident, uh, an incidence where when a person has a stroke, there is a relatively narrow window uh, as to when that stroke can be reversed. Now, you look at this New England Journal of Medicine editorial, January 1st, 2015, and they talk about the thrombectomy being effective up to six hours after the onset of stroke symptoms. Um, and they were advocating that it become more widely used because they had already had about nine years of experience showing that this affected, this, this therapy was effective in reversing stroke. And then what happened just this year, uh, May 2017, some doctors got to be real aggressive with these thrombectomies, and they were finding that up to 24 hours after the onset of an ischemic stroke, they were able to recover the patients. They were able to reverse the impact of that blood clot that was lodged in the brain that was slowly killing brain cells. Now, this is a huge advance in medicine. And how it pertains to the knowledge base that you now have is, you may have a, a, a relative, a friend, or yourself, you're in an ER room, and a doctor's saying, oh, well, it's more than six hours, we can't use the thrombectomy procedure. Well, you know right now to say, guess what, doctor, maybe you missed this, it's effective up to 24 hours after stroke onset. And the reason it's effective is, for some people, they have collateral circulation in the brain. And even though a huge percentage of blood is blocked by one clot, they're still getting enough blood flow to keep those brain cells surviving. So that when that blood clot is removed with a thrombectomy device, a percentage of them are going to be able to survive. So this was the data that came out in May of 2017. And I doubt a lot of doctors right now understand how much more effective a thrombectomy can be even after that six hour window. Because I don't think this is approved by the FDA, by the way, after six hours. That doesn't stop the ER doctor from having the procedure done. You don't need FDA approval to implement a procedure. You need FDA approval to promote a procedure. I am promoting this procedure because I don't sell it. So I'm allowed to do it. Unfortunately, those who have developed the technology and advanced it, they have to wait for the FDA's rubber stamp of approval. But you know different. So in the event of an ischemic stroke, don't give up until at least 24 hours because we now have hard data that we can revive people from acute ischemic stroke a lot longer than what they used to think the upper limit threshold was. So there are a number of South Florida medical centers that are providing the endothelial uh, removal, uh, the endovascular thrombectomy of, an, uh, of a blood clot. And uh, if you look at the timeline here, when 2014 rolled around, uh, we called around all the local hospitals, all the way from South Miami up to North Palm Beach, and most of them were not considered comprehensive stroke centers. But we did identify one or two in each county that did have the technology. 
So we move forward to year 2017, and the good news is, well, most of the hospitals now have incorporated this technology into the emergency room setting. What they typically do is they call a neurosurgeon in or a vascular interventionist to do the endovascular thrombectomy so that they're all able to pretty much offer this. So this slide presentation will be available online, by the way, and we had some good news when we called around all the hospitals in year 2017, like we did in 2014, we found out that the most of them were offering this therapy. So uh, when you go on the Church of Perpetual Life website, you'll get to see the fact that most of the hospitals now offer a procedure the three years after 2014 that is, that is this year so we, we this is a uh, Broward County uh, a whole lot of them uh, continuing with Broward County this is Dade County this is information that you really should log on to the Church of Perpetual Life website and identify what is the closest comprehensive stroke center to where you live and or work? Because you want to make sure when that ambulance comes, they take you to where the technology is, not to where the closest emergency room happens to be that may not offer this type of technology. This is invaluable information. It means the difference of walking out of that hospital in a day or two or being taken by ambulance to a nursing home where you'll spend the rest of your life. And again, Palm Beach County, there was only one or two back in 2014, and now it seems like they're all incorporating this novel way to reverse acute ischemic stroke. But I have to emphasize again, you need to know to demand it because the ER doctor might feel Feel, you're not a candidate for it. Well, if you know you're being paralyzed, you can feel it happening, you might say, well, then just take a chance and try it anyway. Because after 24 hours, or within 24 hours, it very well may be effective. So the endovascular thrombectomy, which we passionately advocated for back in 2014, it's now becoming standard of care, but not quite there yet to guarantee you're going to get the best treatment. I mean, if you go into an ER room with a coronary artery blockage, well, they're real good at reversing that. They, they've got a ways of putting in stints, using TPA, uh, doing emergency open heart surgery if they need to. So they're good with the uh, coronary artery occlusions, but they're not 100% covering the cerebral vascular problems. So what we have here is a rapidly changing window of time, where if we go back to 1995 and you had a stroke, nothing really could be done of, uh, of substance. And then the TPA drug was approved, and that was recovering some people. It was a good drug, but it wasn't used enough. And we move forward again with the thrombectomy, and lots more people are being recovered. So as it relates to when a person is dead, well, before, uh, let's say, 2017 even, lots of stroke victims were going into hospitals, being declared dead and taken to mortuaries. And yet, an endovascular thrombectomy could have saved their life. Uh, what we contend, by the way, is that there are equally effective technologies available right now, but they're being underutilized, so people are needlessly dying. Now, these are the age reversal projects that we are currently investigating. Uh, I'm going to try to update you on each and every one of them, if I can right now. Um, repairing cellular DNA with NAD plus infusions. Those are going to be available in South Florida, I'm hoping by December. We're just asking as many doctors as we can to look at the literature and incorporate that in their infusion practice. Uh, th these are doctors who do uh, vitamin infusions, glutathione infusions. We're asking them to consider the NAD protocols that are being developed. And the good news is uh, the dose of NAD we're finding can be cut in half, and the number of infusions may be reduced from six down to three. So that means just three days of being infused for about three to four hours. You bring your laptop computer in or your iPhone and, or a newspaper or whatever while they're infusing you, and then you leave. And in doing so, you are going to facilitate DNA repair. You may lengthen your telomeres. You're going to strengthen your stem cells ability to function. Huge advantages to NAD plus infusions. And as soon as we have a list of the doctors, we're gonna post them right up here, and you can call them up, make your own appointments. I'm sure they'll be charging different prices. You make your own choice as to what doctor is most convenient and most affordable to you. Uh, the systemic regeneration using young plasma. 
Many people are experimenting with different types of young plasma in an attempt to reverse biologically, biological aging on a systemic basis, a systemic reversal. Uh, Dr. Maharaj's uh, study has received FDA approval. A number of other people are using different techniques. I, I received a phone call on Monday indicating that individuals who have been putting cord plasma into their bodies are getting some rather spectacular reversals on aging biomarkers. Uh, one of the most uh, common biomarker that we use are, is to evaluate DNA methylation. And as we grow older, our DNA methylation, it declines. One individual who had undergone four to five cord plasma infusions was able to see a 12-year reversal in the measurement of DNA methylation pretty significant. Uh, the thymic regeneration, uh, they are working to refine that and make that available. That utilizes growth hormone and some other drugs for only one year to regenerate the thymus gland and reverse immune senescence. The GDF-11 project with Steve Perry up in New York, um, he is inundated with people who are now self-experimenting with GDF-11. He's meticulously tracking that data, so I continue to hear good reports about that. Uh, the dacitinib coercitin study to remove senescent cells, that study has concluded. We now have preliminary data on humans who are given high-dose dacitinib and coercitin for one day, just one administration, and the preliminary results, these are only anecdotal, will have final results in about three months. 50% of the osteoarthritis people are reporting partial or complete remission. And we will follow these people up to see if more of them uh, either go into remission or maybe it was just an anecdotal uh, feedback that was premature. But what we did to avoid the placebo effect is we did a baseline MRI of their affected arthritic joint and we're doing follow-up MRIs. So we will know if the synolytic therapy using dacitinib and quercetin was able to reverse aging at least in their joint and hopefully systemically because some of these people are reporting actually feeling much younger and for those who don't understand this concept when we grow older we have an accumulation of senile cells that interfere with cell-to-cell -cell communication they kind of gum up the works in our body and those senile cells emit inflammatory factors so it generates chronic infl inflammation and impedes cell-to-cell -cell communication uh, by removing the senescent cells using a leukemia drug, dacitinib, just you know what that drug is used for. Leukemia patients take it almost every day. We're talking about one high dose of dacitinib and coercetin to remove. We have preliminary results, we'll have final results that we'll report on at this church um, as it relates to the cellular debris that accumulates with aging inside our cells. There is a drug that organ transplant patients use every day called rapamycin. And that drug has a number of benefits, but one of them is to rid our cells of the accumulated toxic waste products that clog up their efficient operation. Uh, the rapamycin study is going to start very shortly in Southern California. And again, we're going to be looking at a wide range of clinical measures and biomarkers of aging to see if we cannot observe an age reversal effect using an, an existing drug, a drug that's already used by lots and lots of people, but using it in a creative way, which is about five milligrams of rapamycin once a week. Some people are using between two and six, so that's the range between two and six, but instead of using it every day, which would be toxic, once a week does not appear to be inducing toxicity. Mesenchymal stem cells, several people are going to be pursuing research projects aimed at using mesenchymal st stem cells to regenerate older people. And then the hematic poietic stem cells for autoimmunity and cancer, those studies are also proceeding. So lots and lots of good technology happening right now. And I'm getting updates. Every couple days I get a little update, a little anecdote, or I get a clinical measure. The clinical measures are a heck of a lot better. And my own personal experience, by the way, with the NAD plus infusions, I've talked about that before, my sleep patterns are about 80% better. That's the reason I underwent the NAD, because uh, a finding, an accidental finding in our NAD infusion research
research is that everyone who underwent it, and they were typically 80 years of age and older, they were all saying, I'm sleeping a lot better. And they, they were just volunteering that to us. We weren't asking them that question. So when I heard about something that lets people sleep better, I said, well, I'm going to undergo these NAD plus infusions. And as another benefit that's a direct clinical measure, my systolic blood pressure readings are about 15 points lower. I don't take telmosartan anymore, by the way. I was taking it to keep my blood pressure nice and low, but after the NAD infusions, I don't need that antihypertensive drug. So those are two specific benefits I personally received after undergoing NAD infusion therapy in April of 2017. I was impressed enough to try to encourage as many doctors as I can to offer this to their patients so we can reverse as many aspects of aging as possible to stay alive until even more fantastic developments occur. This is a, a chart we've shown before about the multiple benefits of NAD. And, and what uh, and stimulated me a lot, uh, just last night I read a brand new paper. It deals with uh, restoring our own stem cell function. And stem cells are kind of a buzzword. People use them sometimes inappropriately. And some people go and have stem cells put into their body in a way that's dangerous. It would be better to turn back on your own stem cells. And NAD and also boosting AMPK, which is what a lot of you are doing right now with metformin. If we boost AMPK and boost our NAD levels, we seem to restore functionality to our existing stem cells. We reactivate them. So this is a huge, huge opportunity for us to use existing technologies to benefit ourselves. So again, lots of benefits to restoring NAD plus levels. When we were born, we had high levels. When we were younger, we had high levels. By the time we reach age 50, those levels are cut in half. And by the time we hit 80, we've got about anywhere between one and 10% of what our youthful NAD levels were. The infusions boost them, and there are ways to keep them uh, boosted through NAD precursors. Um, this was a study I ran across recently, uh, published about the senolytic drugs. As I mentioned, the dacitinab quercetin study has concluded, and these people are talking about the fact that the drugs are working so well in the animal model, it's time to do the research in humans. Well, we already did it. We already did it. These are Mayo Clinic people, and it takes them forever to do clinical research. They don't seem to have the sense of urgency that people in this church do. Uh, we are rather desperate. We're aging rapidly, and if we don't do something about it, these breakthroughs may benefit our children. They're not going to benefit us. Yeah. So. so the ultimate goal is to develop the appropriate protocol that an aging person should undergo, and it would be based on individual variabilities. I think a person who has any kind of cancer issues should probably undergo dacitinab and rapamycin therapy first, and then follow that up with the NAD plus infusions, uh, and then perhaps uh, young plasma concentrates. Um, GDF-11 is in young plasma, but you can get a more consistent dose of it if you actually use the GDF-11. But this is what we're working on right now to develop a systematic way to reverse biological aging in people and make it so that we can track the results and also make it individualistic enough so that we don't introduce the, the wrong intervention first. Uh, so the typical person might undergo NAD plus infusions first and then undergo the dacitinab and the rapamycin. Or there might be another uh, way of doing it. But that's what the research is all about. That's what we are focused in on. So this is our game plan to accelerate human age reversal research. It involves volunteer activists. It involves donors. It involves a large constituency of people. Uh, some people are able to self-fund their own research, which is fantastic because that enables more research dollars then to go into experimenting with people who don't have those dollars. So for some of the wealthy people who have approached us, we've suggested, well, just pay for this research. Just have yourself uh, as an experimental subject, but not be part of the formal study. And that way you can free up monies for other people who are less fortunate. So we have uh, a number of individuals who are literally inundated, myself and some other people I brought on board, with their desire to become 
self-experimenters. And, and that, that, that says a lot. That says a lot. So I want to again urge anyone in this audience who is interested in age reversal technologies to please register on this website so we can let you know when they are available. And I have people asking me all the time and my often response is, well, you are registered on this website, aren't you? We set it up, it costs us some money, but the idea is to be able to track people who are looking for specific interventions so we can let them know when they may be available, what doctor might make that available. So that's the website you wanna pay attention to. Now I've shown this slide uh, on a number of occasions. It was a prophecy made by Benjamin Franklin uh, we at this church, of course, absolutely believe it, but I recognize the name Joseph Priestley. This is a letter he wrote to Joseph Priestley. Didn't quite know who Joseph Priestley was. I, I had heard of him, didn't quite know who he was, so I did a quick search, and it turns out he's a rather interesting individual. Um, he discovered oxygen, uh, discovered soda water, uh, advanced the science of electricity, and then he went way beyond science. He promoted equal rights for religious dissenters. Uh, paid a big price for that, by the way. Uh, his English home and church were burned down. Uh, back in those days, uh, science didn't mesh well with religion. And uh, he tried to do it, somewhat analogous to what we've done with this church, and he paid a big price. So he had, he had to flee England before they burned him alive and, and come to the United States. Where, and what's interesting is, uh, by the time of his death, he was a member of every major scientific society. So if you want a, a take-home uh, lesson, so to speak, uh, go on to Google and type in Joseph Priestley, and you can read just page after page of incredible work that he did, and, and, he, and he was vilified for it. Uh, he could have very well been, been executed for his uh, doctrine that uh, religion and science belong together, and uh, he actually felt that the the, the, the Christian scriptures would be carried out by mankind advancing medical science. That's the way he viewed it. And that's very analogous to Fedorov, uh, the founder, uh, our prophet of this church, who viewed medical science, uh, scientific progress, uh, as, as a way that uh, fulfills the reason we were created for. So Joseph Priestley, very interesting individual, and I really wouldn't have read about him if it wasn't for uh, letters that he exchanged between Ben Franklin and himself. So it was a very uh, enlightening week when I uh, discovered that and made that PowerPoint slide. So we have concluded my talk for tonight, and I'm open for any questions that the audience might have. Okay. Is this okay, is this working now? I think it is. So this is a good time for a Q&A for Bill. Here, we've got a number of them. Let's go here. Bill, I would like for you to tell us the relation of uh, diet or any specific diet, um, for example, the ketogenic diet in preventing stroke or other diseases. Oh, I think it would as long as you follow it the proper way. Ketogenic diet she was talking about where you eliminate sugars and starches. I mean, really eliminate them. You don't touch bread, pasta, potatoes, any kind of sugary beverage. It can induce some nice weight loss. It's probably a very healthy uh, activity to, to engage in. It's just challenging for a lot of people. We've been advocating more of a Mediterranean type diet because people can usually comply with that. But if you're able to follow a ketogenic diet, you're going to see blood pressure reductions, you're going to see lipid reductions, glucose reductions. You're going to see yourself reverse aging in many respects, and you'll see it with the clinical measures, and you may also feel a lot better. So when it comes to reducing blood pressure, uh, even the American Heart Association strongly advocated before people run out and get a drug, well, change your diet, change your lifestyle, lose weight, uh, give up your bad habits. So yes, good thing to do. Question back here from Jeff. Yes, Bill. Uh, what is your opinion of oral NAD plus? The oral precursor to NAD is nicotinamide riboside. 
that will boost your cellular NAD levels. And if you're under 45 years of age, that may be sufficient. If you're over 45, your NAD levels have plummeted so badly that you are unable to restore them to optimal ranges with the oral precursor. You need the NAD infusions to boost them up to a youthful range and then continue with the oral precursor afterwards to maintain them at the youthful range. But unfortunately, you cannot take in enough nicotinamide riboside to achieve optimal youthful NAD plus cellular levels. There's a question back here from Paul. Uh, yes, Bill. Um, I've heard the word oxygen mentioned a few times. Could you elaborate a little bit on getting sufficient and enough oxygen into the bloodstream and the blood cells? Well, for those who have the ability, time, money to undergo hyperbaric oxygen or even just breathe in pure oxygen, you're doing yourself a big favor. Uh, if you have cancer, uh, the hyperbaric oxygen might be a benefit. Hyperbaric oxygen treatment will promote formation of new stem cells. It's a true anti-aging therapy, and it's something that we could probably put on a whole presentation at this church about, and we probably will someday. The challenge is it's costly, and it takes time, and people tend to prioritize. So what we're looking to do is prioritize in our list of age reversal therapies, what are the most important ones that we can explore right now and validate the hyperbaric uh, chamber uh, technology has been very well validated. It's very well published. So, so uh, uh, oxygen, uh, increasing oxygen to the brain and other parts of the body, great thing to do. From here. Okay. Hi, my name's Kate, and in 2008, I had a devastating stroke from which I recovered without any physical, I don't know, results. And uh, uh, in, the op in the ER, Doogie Hauser came over to me and put his face in mine and said, you had a stroke and you killed all the cells in your front. So I didn't pay any attention to that. But uh, last year I went to the Wien Center at Mount Sinai and I had a a CAT scan done in my brain and found out that the whole right side of my brain is fried. On, on the screen it looks as black as ink. And uh, I guess I just didn't know it because I'm very creative. I write prose and poetry and uh, I'm very alert with my mind. And I'm 87. Yeah. That's worthy of an applause, and it's an example of the aberrations that can occur with people in a good way. There are autopsies done on people in which they find they had multiple myocardial infarctions, heart attacks. Big parts of their heart muscle are infarcted, and yet they didn't develop heart failure. They, they lived a somewhat normal life. And in other areas, the coronary artery was totally blocked, but collateral circulation enabled enough heart muscle function to continue. So there are individual variables, and you are a very fortunate person because others in that identical situation may have died acutely or been paralyzed, but you had enough excess capacity, obviously, to, uh, to survive what was apparently a devastating loss of blood flow to your brain. And you might want to keep track of your inflammatory markers, by the way, because what can happen is even when you survive an insult to the brain, underlying chronic inflammation can slowly damage your brain cells. So you may want to have your C-reactive protein tested. It's a, it's a standard blood test. And if the level is high, take some steps to lower it. There are two drugs that we've used successfully to suppress radiation necrosis, which is a chronic inflammatory condition of the brain. Those are pentoxyphylate pentoxyphylene and endostinex. Uh, neither one of them is approved to treat brain inflammation, but when you put them both together, they happen to work very well. Pentoxyphylene and dostinex. At, at a relatively low dose, by the way, it doesn't require the high doses that other people use. We've successfully reversed chronic inflammatory conditions in the brain using those drugs, uh, but before you even consider that, just have your C-reactive protein levels checked in your blood. It's a question from Douglas. Bill, I just wanted to mention that uh, Larry Lee, 
one of our investors and one of your fans is watching tonight from Canada. I spoke to him today, and Larry has joined the Repromycine trial in California. So you have motivated him to invest with us and to follow you to Radfest, and now he's part of the trial. And he's watching tonight, and I just wanted to have you say hello to him. Well, I certainly appreciate entering that clinical trial, and I also want to let people know that we've referred people to a Dr. Alan Green in Long Island, New York. He's been somewhat inundated with patients who come in. He only charges them $350 for an additional consultation. He writes them a prescription for rapamycin and then recommends they buy it from Canada where it's a lot less expensive. So uh, the information that we've been dis disseminating, it's helping people today. They're acting on it. So the clinical study though is critical because what we're getting from Dr. Green in Long Island is anecdotal feedback. It's good, but we need controlled clinical studies to validate. Is it working? Is it not working? Are we seeing side, side effects? And, and we really need to know how many aging biomarkers is rapamycin going to reverse. So it's great that he's in that clinical study. So Mr. Lee, we appreciate that greatly that you're in that clinical study. It's very important that we are able to collect that data. And by the way, with the doctors that we're working with to refer people patients, what we're asking them for is access to the patient's data. We want to follow as many people as we can, both within the clinical study and outside the clinical trial, so we gather as much accurate information as we can to assess safety and efficacy and perhaps being able to use what results we get with rapamycin to combine it with other age reversal technologies. Question from Jeff. Yes, the, the NAD, or NAD uh, infusions, like when do you think they will uh, be available and like uh, what, what do you think the approximate cost of them will be and like how, do you just do it one time or do you do it several times or how? The NAD infusions in South Florida, we hope, will be available uh, in December, uh, maybe within the next 20 days. Um, the initial protocol was to be using six 1,000 milligram NAD infusions. Uh, we've since learned through our research that we can probably cut that down to three and cut the dose down in half. So it would be three. 500 milligram infusions, it would be done every other day. So you probably schedule a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday visit. We're trying to get the cost, and we say we, these are the doctors that have to make the decisions, but we're urging the doctors to keep the price under $5,000. And that's the kind of start off price. Once this becomes popular, the price will plummet dramatically. The cost of the NAD plus itself is about $125 per infusion. And that price could easily, in a year, be half that much. In South Africa, by the way, you can get 1,000 milligrams of IND, or of NAD for infusion for only $16. So it's not, an, it's not inherently expensive. Please understand, the compounding pharmacy is not overcharging. They have to compound the NAD for each individual patient. So it's the pharmacy cost, the pharmacist's cost to put it together under sterile conditions that cause it to be $125 per infusion cost to the physician. But once they start doing it on, on more of a production line basis, the price should go down dramatically. And once a doctor sets up a large infusion center where perhaps one registered nurse can oversee six to eight patients simultaneously, the cost will plummet dramatically. So we're happy that if we can get this up off the ground for under $4,000, which includes all kinds of biomarkers measures, clinical measures, uh, the NAD, the nurses, the doctor, if we can get that under 5,000, we're going to be happy, and then maybe in a year we can get under 3,000 or 2,000. Uh, we want lots of doctors to get involved so they compete with each other, because it's all the same protocol. It's just a matter of what the doctor's fixed overhead costs are and what they have available for uh, IV infusion. We have a question from Randy. Uh, any comment on the probable risks of NAD infusion? Well, NAD is something that is in our body at a young age. Uh, the, the number when we're young uh, is around 80 as it, as it relates to the blood measure. 
And by the time we reach 50, it drops down to around 40. And then by the time we're, we're 80, well, we don't have much at all. Some people are, are almost zero, by the way, we, we test. Uh, and, and the typical, though, is going to be 2 to 8% is what we're going to see in an 80-year-old. So we're simply replenishing the NAD. And at this point, I can't see why that would be a problem. However, if, you, if, we're, if people start coming to us with 10 days to live or three months to live, in other words, they have multiple comorbidities, I, I'm not going to in any way uh, even estimate what the probabilities of success are because we're going to be treating people who have so many medical problems already that the NAD may or may not do them any good or may or may not induce an unintended consequence. And then there's always iatrogenic risks. And I want to make sure people understand that word. Iatrogenic re it defines an injury or death that occurs as a result of being in a medical setting or as a result of a medical procedure. And NAD infusions involve an IV line being put into your body. Well, there's always that slim chance, very slim. I mean, we, we, we intend to have good people putting that IV line in that you could develop uh, a blood infection. That could kill you. So, so uh, any intervention involves risk, but IVs are done all the time, and it's not considered a significant risk. And, and boosting NAD back up to a youthful level, so far we've gotten spectacular results. Question from James. Yes, I, 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 what's the effect of Xarelta on your kidneys? Uh, or does it have any effect on the kidneys? What drug was that? Xarelta. 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 Oh, you're talking about Xarelta, right. I, I pronounce it a different way. There's, there's Pradoxa and there's Eliquis and then there's Xarelta. What is that effect on the kidneys? I don't know. Get me on Xarelto and also the um, blood pressure medicine, and they, they tell me about well, the blood pressure medicine is going to help kid, uh, help support the, the kidneys from the Xarelto, I guess. I don't know. Well, yes. Are you taking an ACE inhibitor? No. What's the name of the drug you're taking? Xarelto. No, the, well, you said the blood pressure medication. Oh, uh, Perindopril. Okay. Uh, I don't know the exact answer to that question, but as I said in my talk, if you are going to lower your blood pressure, do it slowly. And then the best way to evaluate kidney function is a blood test called cystatin C. That's C-Y-S-T-A-T-I-N hyphen C. Cystatin C is a blood test you should consider taking to make sure your kidneys are not being injured by either of the drugs or just the aging process itself. A standard CBC blood chemistry will look at creatinine and blood urea and nitrogen and the estimated glomular filtration rate, and that's good. But if you have any question, do you know what your creatinine number is, by the way? I don't Okay, because any number over 1.0, we get a little concerned about it. We say, well, pay attention to that. Don't let it get up to 1.5 or 2, and then you have an irreversible problem. So um, I, I don't know the specific answer to your question regarding those drugs, but I can say there are tests to evaluate renal function, and that cystatin C is the, is the premium test. I know every time I, every time I go to the, they have me going in every four months to the, to the doctor. They give me a blood test, and I get every test that they've done on me, so have to go look at that again. Yeah, look at your creatinine and, and your BUN, and, and then also what they're mainly looking at are coagulation factors. They want to make sure they're not over-coagulating you, so they're looking at prothrombin time and INRs, PT, so I, I kind of understand what they're doing, and I just don't know the specific answer to your question other than lower your blood pressure slowly as opposed to trying to do it rapidly. A question from Maria. Bill. What a wonderful presentation, and thanks for everything you do. Such a force. Um, this microphone is failing a little bit. Can you tell us a little more about the age reversal studies that you're doing? Right now, we're developing a standardized protocol of biomarkers that measure aging. And the reason is so critical to standardize this protocol is we'll use the same set of biomarkers for every intervention we test. 
So when we test rapamycin, we want to see how does that affect DNA methylation patterns? How does that affect the inflammatory cytokines? There's actually a couple hundred markers that we're kind of looking at, looking at the cost, and we think we have a pretty good panel put together now that'll cover a lot of bases, but it has not been finalized yet. The good news is we've got laboratories, for-profit laboratories, who are donating their testing to us for these clinical studies. We've got medical doctors donating their professional services and their medical offices to us for these clinical studies. People realize we're on the verge of a biomedical renaissance and that they want to participate. They want to contribute wherever they can. So we're getting a lot of good work done for either no cost or a very low price. Our NAD plus blood workup, by the way, that was all done for free by a laboratory in Australia. They donated their time, their machines, their people to test frozen samples. And we've sent probably four or 500 frozen samples of serum out to the Australian lab and they thaw it and then they test the NAD levels so we know how well the infusions are doing, how well the oral precursors are doing and we now we have information now that probably no one in the world has as it relates to what optimal NAD levels should be and how precipitously they drop with aging. So question from the back. Cool. Uh, Bill, with regards to um, hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, bringing it down of course is going to be you know beneficial to us. Um, any pros and cons on uh, beta blockers, which is one of the more common medications prescribed for high blood pressure? Yeah, yeah we like beta blockers because a side benefit of either propranolol or carvedilol is they have anti-cancer benefits. They can both reduce cancer risk, and we even put them into some cancer treatment protocols. So there are specific anti-cancer mechanisms to both propranolol and carvedilol, only those two beta blockers. So nothing wrong with using a beta blocker to get your blood pressure down below 120. The reason we like the drug telmisartan, which, which is one of the more modern classes of, of drugs that blocks the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor is that it improves endothelial function. That's a side benefit of telmisartan is improving endothelial function, which is different than other antihypertensive drugs they've studied. So either one is fine. Either one of them has side benefits. Question from Ken. Bill, what's your thoughts on uh, taking aspirin each day to prevent stroke? You know, we've looked at the data on aspirin and stroke prevention, aspirin and cancer prevention, and there's a lot of it out there. And some of it contradicts uh, other research. So what we're waiting for in 2018 are the results of three huge placebo-controlled studies that are really going to give us a great answer. Uh, as it relates to esophageal cancer risk reduction, which is very important, that's what motivates me to take a low-dose aspirin virtually every day. Because, I mean, we can get colonoscopies to evaluate whether or not we have an early stage tumor in our colon. Most of us are not undergoing endoscopies. We really should, because colon cancer kills 50,000 Americans every year. Esophageal cancer is killing 19,000. So if you're going to undergo a colonoscopy, you probably should ask the doctor while you're sedated, well, shove the garden hose down my throat also and look at my stomach and my esophagus and my throat in case there's anything there I can catch on an early basis. But the fact of the matter is most esophageal cancers are diagnosed late and very few people survive. So the benefit of aspirin in reducing esophageal cancer risk, it, it definitely reduces colon cancer risk, by the way, we know that. Uh, and then reducing thrombotic stroke risk. The dilemma in identifying a single agent to reduce something as common as stroke is, well, there's blood pressure, there's C-reactive protein, there's LDL, there's glucose, there's insulin, there's fibrinogen, there's all these other factors that can cause an ischemic stroke. So if they test aspirin, even on a big group of people, they have to identify lots of other risks. So they may not get the data they're looking for, even though we think it should work because aspirin inhibits abnormal platelet aggregation, which should reduce thrombotic stroke risk. So personally, I'm taking a low-dose aspirin, mainly for cancer prevention, but I can't tell you that all the data's in yet. But we're going to, probably by next November, we're going to know that answer for sure. Question from Drew. Okay, I have uh, two questions. One is um, those of us that are short on money, let's say we want to try doing it then, uh, through um, 
supplements. Uh, things like um, natokinase or, or garlic or, or oregano oil. Do you, do you talk about that sort of thing as far as trying to clean out your arteries? And also the, um, the other part of it is be complex. I heard that the, you know, like some people take melatonin for sleeping or laetrile uh, for like cancer or whatever. But I heard that if you don't take the entire B complex, that it doesn't work as well. That if you step out on just a couple and the rest are, you're not t taking, that it, does, it's, it symbiotically doesn't help you as much. Yeah, let me answer all your questions and also announce I was supposed to do this earlier, so I'm going to do it now. We, we are funding a local NAD study on early stage dementia, early stage Parkinson's, any early stage neurodegenerative disease. I'm just taking my own money and funding it. Um, so we're doing that locally. So people who have any kind of validated uh, cerebral uh, deficit, well, they can enter an NAD plus clinical trial for nothing. It's free. Uh, but if, if, if you don't have the deficit, you wouldn't be part of that study. You'd have to pay for that. Uh, B-complex, very inexpensive. Natokinase, a great way to reduce fibrinogen. Uh, yeah, the, these low-cost solutions, they work great, like low-dose aspirin may work great. So um, I, uh, the good news about almost everything I'm talking about is that there's, other than the stem cell mobilized plasma concentrates, which will cost a fortune in the beginning, rapamycin, dacetinab, NAD, there's nothing that should make them cost too much money. It's just we're just getting at the very beginning of a whole revolution. And as we know, be it a cell phone or a computer, they cost a lot of money in the beginning. But this is going to rapidly evolve, and lots and lots of doctors are going to realize if I can lower the price, I'll get a lot more patients in the door. So that's what our motivation is, to get as many physicians as possible to offer these therapies and keep the cost coming down, and then recommend people obtain the medications from other countries where they sell for a fraction of the price that they do in the United States. Any other questions for Bill? There's one back here. stroke a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a series of strokes and he had brain surgery for that. I'm wondering if that was the uh, therapy that they gave him. Um, well, if they did surgery, that would not be an endovascular thrombectomy, though that is a surgical procedure. Um, you'd have to explain a little bit more to me, but you're saying they literally went into his cranium and did surgery directly into his brain? I don't know the details, but uh, his sister at the time when it happened told me that um, uh, that he had brain surgery. Okay. So, so I don't know the details. What, what we're talking about tonight is when an acute stroke occurs, you've got injured brain cells that are still alive, but they're slowly dying, go into the brain with the thrombectomy mechanical retrieval device, pull that clot out of the occluded artery, restore blood flow. And that's effective up to 24 hours after the onset of stroke symptoms. A person who has had a stroke for a long period, and others have had stroke damage for a long period of time, well, that would not necessarily be the treatment that would be used. So what, what they did, I, I don't have knowledge of. Okay, see, I'll ask him to see if he, if he knows. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Last call for questions. Bill, I think we did it. Ladies and gentlemen, a hand for okay. Mr. Bill Thank Falloon. You. Thank you. I'd like to make note of the fact that we will be having his slide presentation on our website by tomorrow. So if you'd like to re reference his slide presentation or share it with someone, you'll be able to access it at the churchofperpetuallife.org website. Also, I'd like to mention that this video from tonight, the the live streaming has been recorded and will be available probably later on tonight. And you can also go to our website and see that on our YouTube channel. You can get to our YouTube channel on a YouTube link on the website in the upper left corner. So don't forget that next month we're going to be the second Thursday of the month. It's uh, December the 14th. And it'll be here with uh, Jim Stroll and Bernadine from People Unlimited talking about unlimited lifespans and the RAD, RADFest. So they'll be here, and that'll be the second Thursday 
in December, which is out of the norm for us, but it will uh, be because that's when they're in town, and we're looking forward to seeing you then. Thank you for coming tonight, and our chef has prepared a lovely dinner downstairs. I hope that you can stick around, and you'll be able to meet with Bill in person. And Maria, thank you for coming, and Gary. I'm glad you are here. Okay. Thank you. It's called Forever Young. May the good Lord be with you down every road you roll. And may sunshine and happiness surround you when you're far from home. And may you grow to be proud, dignified and true. And do unto others as you'd have done to you. And be brave, and in my heart you'll always stay forever young, forever young, forever young, forever young. May good fortune be with you, may your guiding light be strong. Build a stairway to heaven with a prince or a vagabond. in vain and in my heart you will remain forever young forever young forever young forever young forever young forever young I served.